All right, hi. Um, is my audio good? I can only hear me. Okay, thank you so much. Bad, amazing audience. Are you ready to hear about the best parts of my favorite things? Yeah. Cool. I love it. Thank you. Okay, so my first favorite thing is this conference talk. <laughs> it's me sharing things I think are cool. I love these things so much, and I would like for you to love them. Uh, you should use them too. I, in my opinion, they're really cool to use. And actually more important than using them is build more things like this. The more things that there are in the world that people really, really love, the better we all have experienced the world. And also, this conference talk is, Damon Khan's keynotes are like, they could be 40 minutes or they could be 10 like everyone else. So I kind of tried to go for the middle. So my favorite thing's not mentioned here. If it feels like I really, really like something else that's not on this list, I totally do. You should come poke me and be like, hey, you sound like you love Redis. I do. <laughs> and also, the last thing is, if you really like it, that makes it good. Go you, have fun, make stuff. Please love all of your amazing things. And I try my best to not have any like, here's this other thing I don't like. Everything in here, things that I really like. <laughs> all right. So my first part, first section, is my favorite ways to read stuff. I find as a programmer, most of what I'm doing is reading code, like all the time. Um, I can't read books anymore because code is just so interesting to me by contrast. It's like <laughs> completely reformed the way I want to read things. But now I realize that I have like all of these patterns around how I really like to read code. And one of them is I really like reading code under version control. Um, I figure most people are using version control, but I really like to talk about like why I really love using this thing. The first thing is that whenever I join a new organization, I walk the Git history in every large repo all the way back to the beginning. I time travel all of your commits. So like, think about that when you're writing the commit messages. <laughs> But like, it's really fun to see people from like, I'm like joining this org in like 2019, and I'm like, yeah, it's like an established startup. Like everyone's been working here so long. I'm looking at commits from like 2010, and they're like, does this even work? <laughs> it's so fun and cool to like time travel to different parts of your organization, different parts of your code, and see how people were experiencing things. And Git and version control and SVN and Mercurial, I don't know the other ones, they all allow that, and that's really cool. Um, Second thing is that resolving complex merge conflicts is like ultimate teamwork. I'm like working for my coworker, and they're like, I'm gonna work on like these three lines, and you're gonna work on like those four lines here, and we're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna like squeeze in, we're gonna like put two Jenga towers together, <laughs> and then they're gonna come together to make like a million dollar product. No, really, I promise. And that works on a regular basis. Like I'll constantly tell my coworkers, like I might edit the lines of a prospective database and you get the application level and then it just works, right? And you can have like hundreds of people doing this at once and that's so cool. Like you can't do that with like a Word document. Well, okay, thanks Google for allowing us to do that with a Word document, but <laughs> <laughs> before Google Docs, you couldn't do it with a Word document. Um, my last thing that I really, really love about version control is that multi-threading makes me feel like superpowers, specifically the superpower of having three of me. I can handle like three branches at once, I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> I'm like constantly, if I make a pull request, I'm like, it's too large. Okay, I'll split it in three, and here's like three pull requests, three successive pull requests that all combo into each other, and I'll go to my boss and it's like, there's three of me, and I'm like, me one is like, so here's the application layer, cool, 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 sell that. Me two is like, here's a database, right? And me three is like, here's the front end, right? And that's I, I can, like, there's like a, a code encoding of having three separate streams of thought for the one thing that you're making, and that's so cool that we have software that allows that mental model. A second favorite way to read things is things with semantic versioning, or any versioning with a well-known scheme. Semantic versioning is the one that I know. Um, I really like semantic versioning for the very specific thing of, I like looking at how versions change over time to describe how, how the thing you're making is stable with respect, with respect to its consumers, stable internally, how you're thinking about it. Some of my favorite patterns are when I see two major updates in a row with no patches in between. <laughs> you broke it, 
and then you realize that you really broke it. <laughs> when I see like, when I see one major update, 300 patches, and then five beta versions, you broke it, and then you want us to make sure that you did not break the next one. It's going to break for someone, but like, you took the time to really like, tease out, like, this is going to break for only 1% like, of people, and they'll tell us it's OK. Um, my favorite thing is that if I, see, if I see patterns of one major version, five patches, another major version, that, that next major version is broken for 50% of people, get the major plus the patch version. That's very specific. Like, so get the 3.01. 3.0, broken, always. <laughs> I don't care what you're making. You semantic version it, you're doing it right, I can tell. And I can tell this over like large products and like large code bases. There's a big, there's a few big exceptions like React does, I think their major versions increment like every year-ish, which might also be semantic versioning, I don't know. but. When we get these patterns for describing how things will change over time, we can make better judgments about how our industry is changing. Um, ah, the last bullet is already what I talked about. OK, the next thing I really like to read with is public versus private APIs. Um, when I wrote this, the idea I have in my head is, so it says public versus private APIs. But like, the thought I have when I'm reading this is like, good, shiny code versus like, the inner workings, the like plumbing of your code, the like crusty undercurrent. And I like that we have these dichotomies, right? I like that we like we have we have whole repos which you can go in and you can go in and you see like, here's the like cool top part of it, and like here's the part where you should look at. It's like really nice. I made it just for you, it's version and everything. And here's the internals where like there's like a like a like a recursive loop in here. You don't care about that, don't care about that. It does what you want. <laughs> I promise. There's like some big math in here. No, you just install stuff. It's okay. I swear. <laughs> right? Um, and prior to software engineering, I really didn't have this pattern for like, like here's our coherent external face. It's really solid. And here's our internal face where like it's like it's like the inside of a, like a star. Everything's just like churning around and it's like messy, but it gets the job done. Really gets the job done. Um, and I find I find that when I find that it's, it creates really nice patterns when I want to look at my specific like public entry point, and then if I like, if ever I have like some public functionality that I know doesn't work for me, I think, okay, I'm gonna walk it up to its internal to its internal private functioning, just like a few steps, so I know how it's working enough to change it, and that's a pattern I can use in most repos. Like I'll be like, pip install isn't working. Okay, what's pip install actually doing? Private APIs, blah blah blah. Keep going, and that's a really nice pattern that I can like abstract across lots of code that I'm reading. Oh yeah, my, another favorite way I have to recode is infrastructure as code. This one's a recent one for me. Um, because really, and this is different because it's not like, a lot of infrastructure as code stuff is, is the difference between infrastructure as code and like the, the other thing is my coworker comes to me and they're like, okay, I set up the database. And I'm like, all right, cool, nice database. Three months later, maybe that coworker leaves or on vacation and I need to set up another one of those databases. And I'm like, right, I go to the UI and I'm like, hey Heroku, give me a database. And Heroku's like, I don't just give you a database, like what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> In this moment, I realized my coworker telling me I click some buttons to create a database is probably a bit more nuanced. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you, but that's the problem infrastructure, infrastructure as code really, really solves for me. I like to call it the, the one thing that really helps you tell your coworkers how you're doing stuff, or just other people in your industry how you're doing stuff, in a way that's repeatable and auditable, as opposed to just like, like I, like I guess I, I could take a video of my co coworker clicking buttons in a Heroku UI. <laughs> I, but I prefer infrastructure as code, just personally. And it's really good for communicating like state changes too. Like I've never been able to, I've never been able to like actually diff any infrastructure that it wasn't made without IA, IA infrastructure as code. Like infrastructure stood up like with visual UIs. I like I could say that you click the different button, but what that means actually is really hard to quantify. And so that's one of my favorite things uh, about infrastructure as code. It's just one of these things where like there's times when you want to use it and there's times when you won't want to use it. 
But when you, when you really, really need it, when you have like 10 other people relying on infrastructure that you need, it is a really cool boost in helping other people understand what it is you're doing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, at first this was search, and then I realized that really for me it's grep. Like, grep specifically in its many incarnations. Um, when, I, when I'm like looking at other people, like, and I'm like, yeah, you search for the code to do X. And, and when I realize the moment that they don't use grep regularly, I'm like, oh my gosh, look, let me tell you. <laughs> you can search this code base for stuff. Like, you can just put words in and then you find them in your code base. <laughs> you would think that being able to find information isn't a hard problem, but I think the companies that are really profitable in the world would tell you otherwise. <laughs> Right, and so I spent a lot of time being like, you know what, I can find so much stuff. I, I'm an infrastructure team at my current job, and so I spent a lot of time like going through hundreds of repos and being like, okay, I need to update all of these things like dozens and dozens of times. And it is, this is a godsend. Like, I don't know how I could do anything without the ability to search through code. And a lot of my work nowadays is like going through and finding one particular piece of information and finding out where it's repeated. And that's basically impossible without being able to like go into a bunch of files and then grab them really fast and then like put some really complex regex on like what is like millions of lines of code. So I love this. Go into your, com your command line, grab some stuff. It's not accessible actually. You might have to read a document first. <laughs> but, but once you read it, you'll be able to find stuff. Super useful, finding stuff is. All right, next is my favorite ways to write stuff. Like, I don't even know what this section is about. Hmm, let me see. <laughs> um, I write lots of things. I write code. I write, I think this is about documentation. It is. <laughs> <laughs> right. This one is about documentation. My favorite way to write documentation is automated documentation because this automated documentation tricks me into thinking that I'm not writing documentation. Because I sit around and tell myself, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not a good writer after I wrote three paragraphs about the code I just like, wrote. And I'm like, no, surely that's not documentation. And then the auto documentator is like pulling that in the markdown and like someone's reading it and I'm like, oh, I did write documentation. Amazing, thank you, thank you. I call it, I call it tricking programmers into writing more as a service. <laughs> I really like it, I really like it. And Probably a minor bit here is that it removes just a little tiny bit of copy pasting from your life, which like, you know, it's kind of nice. Like I like to do one less action in order to get my job done, but at the same time, you know what I really like doing? Copy pasting. <laughs> I love copy pasting. I wrote from the internet here, but you all know what I mean. I mean from Stack Overflow specifically. <laughs> I. I call, so I, I've taken this new pattern of calling package managers copy pasting from my community. <laughs> I install your package, I'm copy pasting from you. Thank you, Blask, for letting me copy paste your whole repo <laughs> repeatedly. It's really good, really good. Copy paste from my coworkers all the time. We use this in a form of skeletons, skeleton projects to do copy paste, and you know, it's, there's, there's lots of things where we're like, we're like, we're like the skeleton denormalization process and blah, 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 and like bulk updates, and really it's just like, complex words for the patterns of copy pasting. <laughs> my favorite thing actually is copy pasting for myself. I'll do a thing where I, write, where I write code that I know won't work at the current point in time that I'm working on something, but I'm like, it might work in the future. And so at any point in time, I'm like sitting on like these, big, these like all of these different bits of code, and I tell, myself, I tell my coworkers like, yeah, so like if ever you need like functional tests for like this set of like the repo that like we never tested before, I have just some functional tests in my back pocket, copy pasted this repo. And they're like, what you, where did you get those from? And I was like, I don't know, I was just working on stuff. And I was like, you know what, I would want to copy paste in the future, some functional tests. <laughs> you know, just copy paste some database migration scripts. I have so many copy pasted database migrations, you don't even know. <laughs> the hardest part about leaving one job and going to the next job is you lose your database migrations to copy paste. <laughs> from yourself even, see? Hard times out there. My next favorite way to write things is with autocompletes. Autocomplete, I love autocomplete. Autocomplete is like the, hey, can I get uh, something with a D? Like a, <laughs> like a um, you know what I mean? Like the thing with the, the it stores information, um, starts with a D, database. <laughs> 
thank you, autocomplete, for completing this very basic concept. I think this is good for my memory. I can just remember the concept of the thing where I'm like, um, you know, asynchronicity, a, a, a and it just finishes for me. Thank you. Thank you. They're like, it's like an abstraction between like, here's the knowledge in my head, and here's the concept that everyone else understands. <laughs> and autocomplete like jumps me in between those two things. Sometimes they make me faster. Sometimes I spend time yelling at the autocomplete to read my mind better. <laughs> this is how it is. But, but overall, I really, really like it. Super cool. It's my favorite part of text editors. There's a, there's a slide I didn't make here because I didn't know what to put on it. It was just like, you know what I really like? Just like text editors. <laughs> I love to edit text. I just edit text all day. I read text in text editors. I edit it. It's just so good. I love them. Love to write things. All right, cool. Next set of favorite things are my favorite tools to build with. I love these things. I mean, I love all the rest of these things, but these things I also love. Postgres. I love freaking Postgres so much. Thanks, everyone who's ever worked on Postgres. Like, I love y'all. Postgres is like, I'll, often I'll be in conversation and I'm like, yeah, like, can you just give me like a Postgres as a replacement term for like, can you like spin up a database? That's how ubiquitous you all are right now, so thanks for that. And then also, like, you know, down the line, I'm like, hey, like, I want to make this data like, like graph, like graph theory or something, or like, <laughs> now it's a document store. Like, I don't know why, but I just really want to put documents in my Postgres database. <laughs> and unless you do that, that's amazing. I like it. I like that we have this like generic purpose database here. And also, the fact that so many people use it means that like, I've actually never run into a Postgres problem that someone else didn't already have, <laughs> which kind of tells you how much I use Postgres, which is not a ton. But, but it's super useful. Any tool that gets to this, like, like so many people use it that you certainly can get help with it point is like in a really amazing spot. Oh, we have, we have computers doing computer things here. I understand. <laughs> I can now help with this computer process. OK, right. Computers are also a tool that I love, just in general. All this talk is about computers, I realize. <laughs> Give a round of applause for computers. Yes. I love those. I love those. Thank you. Thank you. My next favorite thing are right, package managers. I love these automated copy pasters. They're so good. They're so good. I love package managers when they get to the point where I can just be like, OK, so my story is the first time I, I'd, I'd used Linux for like a few years, I'd never used Mac. I switched to Mac, and I was like, I don't know, uh, like Mac package manager? And then Homebrew was like, here I am, the missing package manager. And I'm like, I appreciate that branding, but since I found it, it's not missing. But thank you. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, I need to install my app. Right, OK, I know I want a Postgres and then I have Homebrew here, and Homebrew is a package manager, and I open this open CLI, and I'm like, brew, install Postgres, and then it worked, and I had a whole freaking database on my computer? I just like guessed some words online, and I was like, okay, maybe, possibly, these series of commands will give me an entire database, and then it did. I love that, I love that so much. I love that we have like tiny, short series of words, maybe like three or four words, to like install the entire world on your computer. Like, I can like, go into my terminal and like get some tiny subset of Google's entire infrastructure just with this tiny package manager. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes your computer's friends will heat up a little bit, so that really tells you you're doing some big stuff. <laughs> you ever machine learned? That's your computer doing work. <laughs> my other favorite thing? My other favorite thing, and this is more on the UX side rather than the scale side, are a concept I, I've seen called NPX business cards. You should look that up later, because I'm speaking to you right now. But <laughs> audience at home, look this up. I love NPX business cards. It's this thing where, like, OK, so there's package managers, all of them. They download some code and they execute it, right? Well, there's some, a few package managers now. Uh, NPM does it. Yarn does it. Uh, I think Fundler was working on a variant of this. Where they want to download some code and execute a specific script. That's NPX. And then people, enough people saw that that they were like, you know what, I can have a CLI business card, which is really cool. I love the idea that like, 
you know, we just like, here's a little bit of my code. And it's just like information about me. That's websites also, for the record. <laughs> but, but if you think about websites but for terminals, that's what you have to. <laughs> and that's why I love package managers, because they enable stuff like that. I love web microframeworks. My, my story about web microframeworks is cool guy Bob from the bike store. So I go to Bob from the bike store, and I'm like, hey, I, I just want a tire. And he's like, what kind of tire? And I'm like, oh, just give me a tire. <laughs> and he's like, so like a tire for a bike? And I'm like, I guess. <laughs> like, it could be a bike-sized tire. It could be like a tractor. So I, I just, I want a tire. And he's like, OK, just here's a, a general purpose tire for anything you might want to do with it, hanging from a tree. I don't know, you're going like, to make this chair. I don't know what you're going to do with it. Here's a tire, right? Like, I like that. You know, I like Bob from the bike store with the tiny micro framework who just like, I, don't, I, I, I have a whole big thing here about the concept of micro frameworks. I don't actually mention any. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I guess it, I should do due diligence to be like, okay, like Flask and Sinatra, like they just handle their like, I go up to the, the package manager and I'm like, hey, can you get me like just a web server? And they're like, what kind of web server? And I'm like, I just like the teeniest, like, I just need a web server so I can go back to doing my life. <laughs> And that's web macro frameworks for you. I like it. I like it for when I have big ideas that I think don't fit into ideas that anyone else has ever had. They probably do, mind you. But, but when I think I'm being super, super unique, macro frameworks are there to give me just a tire. By contrast, we have macro frameworks. Macro frameworks don't ever describe themselves like this. They just call themselves frameworks. <laughs> OK, friends. So, Web macro frameworks are like Alice, the contractor, the like plumbing contractor, where you're like, hi, Alice, uh, I flooded my, my like bathroom toilet in the bottom floor, and it like flooded the whole bottom floor. And so like my half my house is unlivable. Can you work on that? <laughs> and Alice is like, like the whole, like, so I need to fix like half of your entire house. That's like basically your whole website, right? Like, so I go to Pip, and I'm like, hey, to Django, can you give me like, most of the website. <laughs> just, I'll add some bits at the end, but can you just give me like 90% of a website? <laughs> and then I'll come in later and then fix it. And then the contractor's like, I am skilled to do that. That's ridiculous that you need so much. But here you go. That's macro frameworks. They're really about like, like you know what you want, and it fits in a really tight, like, idea of things that other people want, which is cool. And so they can get you as close to your goal as you can really manage, or as they, they can really manage, help you with a lot of stuff. People who work on macro frameworks, they have, I spend a lot of time looking at the decisions people make, because you have to make decisions about potentially millions of people, and everyone needs their basement unflooded, but like in a slightly different way, and that's, <laughs> that's a lot. Thank you, macro frameworks, for doing this for me. All right. My other favorite thing to build with are error contexts. The slide went through many forms. At first it was tracebacks, then it was error codes, then it was tracebacks and error codes. Now it's error contexts. And it's about the idea of going from like how much you're describing something that just went wrong. I, I find that when I'm working on like say the like, I don't know what the concept is behind Nginx, the web server, that layer, and it's just like, 500, there was an error. And I'm like, thanks, Nginx. <laughs> Very informative. And then you get to like the programming language layer, and when they start telling you like actual useful things, like there was an error here, your data was this, the TV was on, you probably buffer overflowed. Actually, that's a bad example because I've never seen a programming language that's like, I might not have memory, they just die. <laughs> Advice for programming language designers. but. But other errors describe really, really, really useful state that you can use to fix it. And I like to think of good er error context as like a good therapist. When you need a good therapist, you know it. Like, you're like, you just built something, you're about to launch it in two or three days, and then you get this like, you get this like flood of 500s. Like your Slack channel is just lit up with all of these alerts. You're like, oh no, I hate this, what's going on? And you go into like the logs, and an error context is like, you didn't copy paste the one thing from here, and it's just gone. <laughs> and you're like, oh, 
thanks, I'm calm now. <laughs> Thank you, error context. This is very, very calming. Because I think good error context is like a good therapist. Oh, yeah. OK. I love to build with containers. I only started building with them recently. I find it amazing that I can have my computer and also like hundreds of other people's computers inside my computer. Well, OK, not hundreds, more like five. <laughs> <laughs> five other computers inside my computer. It's really cool. I love, I love this idea that I can just repeat other people's setups a whole bunch of times. I don't know how we got to this point that we have this amazing technology, but like, thank you. I'm also really amazed that like, I know about the whole idea of like, you can't run a Docker in a Docker, I get it, but really that's black hole territory, you watch yourselves. <laughs> watch it. But it's super cool, I love building with containers, I wanna build everything in container now, it's amazing. All right, see this is why I was confused about the documentation bit, because this bit is about talking to computers. I spent a lot of time talking to computers, I have lots of like really flowy words for this, like computer, computer, uh, what's the word? When you talk to snakes, computer password tonger, I don't know, you know, computer slit, I don't know, you know, all of these complex words I have. Really, I just don't like calling myself a software engineer because that seems reductive. I'm like, I just, I speak to the, I tell the computers my thoughts and wills and they obey me. <laughs> like 80% of the time. <laughs> It's super good. And here are some of my favorite ways to do that. So I love talking to computers in Python. <laughs> For the record, I have to say that Python is my literal mom. When I was a tiny baby of like one trans years old, Python was like, I will save you by giving you ways to talk to people. Super good. I love you, Python. Thanks, you, mom. <laughs> I also like Python because it's very flexible, which is what the next point is about. All my best terrible programming crimes come from Python. <laughs> my best programming where people are like looking at it and they're like, why would you, why would you do that? Why does a programming language you do that? Like, why did you have three layers of abstract base classes? Like, why would you need that? You were just composing a string. <laughs> Python is definitely the programming language for that, and, and usually it's very forgiving, gives you nice errors. Like the infinite loops I got myself into with Python, usually it tells you just like you did this thing a million times, and I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> I did tell you to do that, Python, sorry. <laughs> and I also like Python because it's really popular. Um, my favorite thing that I don't, my favorite thing that I don't mention a whole lot is that this one time I was hanging out in a Slack channel with a bunch of like Python like maintainers or something. And then they asked a question on Stack Overflow about Python. And I was like, but you're the maintainer. And it was, but the idea is that so many people use this language that like it's actually very useful to like touch the community animus and like see how everyone feels and how everyone's working. And then there's like so much stuff going on with Python right now that you can usually find someone that's doing something even remotely close to what you're doing. And it's super useful. I love it. Next, I like Ruby on Rails. I didn't know what to put on Rails on here because I, I, I have actually used a lot of Ruby not on Rails. But really what I recommend is the on Rails version of Ruby. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It looks really nice. I spent a lot of I spent a lot of my time having like screenshots of my code written in Ruby. I'll like write something in like Python or Go, and then I'll rewrite it in Ruby just to take a screenshot. <laughs> Because it looks really, really, really nice. I love it. My other favorite thing about Ruby is the, the, all of the like, ra like Ruby and Rails automation of things that just work. Ruby maintainers out there, keep the Ruby magic. I love it. It sells me on your programming language. It looks super cool to read, and it makes it work really well. And also, writing Ruby is the fastest way I've ever built a fully functional website. Like Rails, the Ruby macro framework is like, I. It's the most batteries included thing I've ever used, and I love it so much. I love JavaScript. Specifically, I love JavaScript for learning asynchronous ex execution. I didn't know anything about like the concept of asynchronous execution before I started using JavaScript, and JavaScript like beat me over the head with it. <laughs> Repeatedly, they were like, you can't have synchronous UI, you just can't. I was like, I don't know what that means. And JavaScript, JavaScript made me learn. 
It's been getting better, actually, over the years. Like, the different, like, ES5, ES6, all of those have been getting better at helping people understand asynchronous execution. And so I think if you really are like, hey, how do I make two threads of work execute at the same time? In my opinion, JavaScript is a really great place to learn that. Also, it's really good if you want to learn how, learn how code could execute in a different context than you, than you normally would. When I was writing in Python, I wrote a lot of scripts that were like, it's a CLI script, it's like single threaded, you execute it on command line, it does a thing, and then it talks to you. That's like, it's very in and out, it's very basic. When I wrote in JavaScript, I had to like really understand how my code was executing. Like the concept of like running the, my JS code on like, like the node V8 container in CLI, like I had to wrap my head around that. And the fact that that was actually identical to executing my code or kind of identical to executing my code in a browser. Like it makes you, JavaScript and its current incarnation makes you think about code and code execution differently, which is super valuable. On top of that, there's TypeScript, which my opinion of TypeScript is, TypeScript is the you don't know JavaScript very well language. <laughs> I went into TypeScript and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna like use like a transpiler for JavaScript because I know JavaScript now. And TypeScript was like, no, you do not. <laughs> you do not know what any of these types are. You don't know how, transcript, how things are transferred between them. You don't know how the functions are called. You don't know anything. TypeScript taught me all of those things. I loved it. This is extractable probably to any sort of like any language that's like not typed by default and then you add like a typed transpiler on top of it, it will probably teach you all of these things about the language that you didn't think about when you were working in the untyped version. And I think that's super valuable. Also like TypeScript specifically happens to be my favorite way to learn about type systems. It, happens, it also happens to be the, like, the first way I learned about type systems, so like I'm biased because it was my first, but you should definitely tell me about other cool ways to learn about typing type systems, not like typing words like we do every day. <laughs> I love Rust. Rust. <laughs> My gosh, Rust. Thank you, friends, for building the amazing bar checker and all the memory management stuff. I go to war against it quite frequently. <laughs> I gained like eight levels just fighting the bar checker. <laughs> I apologize for, the, for any like Rust developers here, but I, wouldn't, I would recommend learning Rust when you don't have a deadline. <laughs> you don't have anything you need to get done. You just want to learn a whole lot, particularly about memory management. That's when Rust is really good for you. You go in with the bar checker, you go like 10 rounds, and you come back being like, I understand memory exceptions. Rust is really good for that. And, and when I came into it, I'd already knew a bunch of programming, and so I was like, oh no, am I going to enter a community where everyone feels like they know everything? But the Rust community had a really good community for like where everyone was like, we all don't know how the borrow checker works. <laughs> there was, I've seen multiple talks that are just like, like variants of fighting against the borrow checker, which are like Rust's version of like making you understand memory management, which is cool that it has this like pervasive learning design in this community. I like GoLang. I like Golang because it will make you never show your clients an exception again. Mind you, this is fake. <laughs> that is not true. You can say that, you will probably show an exception, but you will dramatically, probably dramatically decrease <laughs> the amount of exceptions you show your clients. Also, Golang very specifically has the best experience with building binaries that I've ever seen. In every other language, I was like, oh, I need to build a binary, this is annoying, I don't, I don't, I don't want to understand how binaries are built, I just want one. And Golang was just like, okay, you just do the regular vote process, and here's a binary that everyone can run. And I was like, and that's it? <laughs> that was it. It was really cool. I loved it. Thanks, Golang. You're my favorite thing for the amazing binaries. Oh, we're at the conclusion. In conclusion, some of my favorite things are all of you for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you for listening to my talk. Definitely tell you about me, tell me about your favorite things, particularly if I didn't mention it, and also if I did mention it. Tell your friends about your favorite things and have a really great time at the rest of the conference. <laughs>